Over the next three decades, I attracted a lot of other dysfunctional companies. Many of them were experiencing the worst business challenges that I've ever seen. Now, I feel grateful to have been part of these turnarounds because it helped to test my leadership skills. But I was also grateful because it's how I was able to build fast attack leadership. You see, in the next turnaround I went in, we built a one-page captain's plan, and then I went back and took the leadership communication skills from the submarine force. You get there, that turnaround went great. In the next opportunity that I went into, built a one-page captain's orders, communication leadership skills, went back to the submarine force and grabbed the recognition framework, bought that forward, that turnaround went great. And so it was over these next two decades that I was able to build fast attack leadership. Now it was during this time that I was trying to be a better business leader, but I was also trying to be a better leader in the other important leadership parts of my life, namely as a husband and a father. And you can see this picture here up on the screen. There's a lot of hair in that picture and it's not on my head. Now, I read every book on how to father a successful daughter, and women are from Venus, and men are from Jupiter, or Mars, or the moon, or I don't know, wherever I'm from. But what I learned is that nothing ever prepares you for everything that's going to come up. Now, the last part where I really learned a lot was coaching eight to 10-year-old kids how to play competitive soccer. And if you ever want to test your leadership and your communication skills, Go coach a bunch of eight-year-olds something you know deeply about, they know nothing about, and then manage their overzealous grandparents and parents on the sideline. You're all really good sideline parents, right? Yeah. So look, it was over the time period that I had tens of thousands of human interactions. I was able to look deeply into the eyes and into the heart of what motivates human beings. And here's what I learned about us as human beings. Number one is we crave simple, meaningful messages. Number two is I believe attached to every single one of our souls is the wanting to belong to something bigger than ourselves. And number three is we get really excited when we know we've made a difference and we've been recognized for that. So for me as a leader, as I was trying to connect with other human beings, it was my duty, it was my responsibility to help fulfill these human needs for others. And if I could fulfill those human needs, I would have a great relationship. And if I could do it in a team setting, I would create a really, really strong team. And that's what we're really focused on. We're really focused on helping people lead more purposeful and inspiring lives. 400 feet below the surface of the ocean on a mission critical to national security, somewhere in the Western Pacific Ocean. Our submarine is traveling north when all of a sudden there's a noise over here on the left-hand side that I have to investigate. I give the immediate course order to come left to course 270. As we're coming left, I'm monitoring the entire situation and course correcting. Continue left to 250. As I hit 255, I've overshot the target come right to 275, come left to 266. You see, in a 90-second period, I've made five different decisions. The first four decisions were 4070, where I didn't have complete information. And what you can say is I didn't make the right decision on those first four. I failed on those. But we can't look at it from that perspective. You see, those first four decisions allowed me to fail my way to a successful fifth decision. Now, one note here is that you can't use 4070 on every decision that needs to be made at your company. If you're doing the load calculations for an eight-story building or you're putting together the loan documents of a $100 million loan, those have to be perfect. All right, so how does it feel when you're making a decision and you're only 40% probability that you're correct? Look, it feels really, really uncomfortable, and I think that's the point of it. What 47 makes okay is that it feels uncomfortable to make a decision, especially when you don't have enough information. All right, so here's a couple of tips that you can put into place as you implement 4070 in your company. First, when there's any type of conversation that's happening, 
anyone in the conversation, if they believe you're between 40 and 70, they're to speak up and ask, are we above 40? If everyone in the conversation says yes, encourage the team to take the shot and make the decision. The second tip is, your next decision is not your final decision. Now, the best example of this is the F-21 torpedo. It has a speed of 55 miles an hour and can hit a target up to 31 miles away. Now, if I'm 600 feet below the surface of the ocean, I have a target that's over here on the right, and I have to engage that target, I'll start moving the submarine to the right and I'll immediately fire the torpedoes. The reason I can do this is because what do you see here on the screen that is in between the torpedo and the submarine? Yes, you see a wire. And so what's happening in the submarine is we're monitoring all the information of the torpedo and we're also monitoring the information of the target. And then we're sending signals to the torpedo to course correct to success. Now look, when we have some type of challenge, it's just human nature to try to figure out all of the next steps that we need to take. But what's really important to focus on is the next step. Can we 4070 it and can we course correct to success? All right, so let's summarize the top three things that you need to put in place so you can give your employees the confidence to take the shot. Number one is make sure that you're leveraging technology to manage the sea of infinity. Number two is make sure that every employee understands the top three and their top one quarterly goals of their department. And then number four is adopt the 4070 mindset and course correct to success image that you see here behind me, it's the most viewed pipe in the safety and quality industry over the past 60 years. Now, I was first exposed to this mangled pipe image as a young submarine officer learning about submarine design and quality and safety and the dangers of operating in the deepest parts of the ocean and how unforgiving that it can be. Let me share with you the backstory behind the pipe. It's the morning of April 10th, 1963, and the US Navy's most advanced deepest diving nuclear submarine the USS Thresher has 129 crew members on board and it's completing its sea trials. Now it's about 190 miles off the coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, in water that is 8,400 feet deep. The surface ship Skylark is in constant communications with the Thresher as it travels to its test depth of 1,300 feet. Now every 100 feet, the Thresher is pausing just to check the integrity of all the systems. At 9.09, Thresher is estimated to be at 1,300 feet, and a brazed pipe joint ruptures in the engine room. Water floods in at 100,000 gallons per minute. Now, to get the submarine to the surface, the captain orders all ahead full speed, and he attempts to blow the air into the main ballast tanks. The high-pressure air is not filling the ballast tanks. At 9.11, water is flooding into the compartment. It shorts the electrical panels that are running the main coolant pumps, and those lose power, and it shuts down the nuclear reactor, and all propulsion is lost. At 9.13, Skylark receives garbled communications. Experiencing minor difficulties, have positive up angle, attempting to blow. They again attempt to blow air into the main ballast tanks, but to no avail. At 9.16, they receive garbled communications that they're 900 feet below their test depth. They're at 2,200 feet. And just two minutes later, Skylark detects a high-energy, low-frequency noise, characteristics of a submarine imploding. Now, it turns out that the submarine imploded with such force that all that's left at the bottom of the ocean is a huge scrap metal yard. Now, the implosion took 1 20th of a second to happen, which is way too fast for the human nervous system to perceive. Now, in the review of the incident, there were so many things that were exposed. But the primary driver during that time was the Cold War. You know, at that time, the US felt the pressure to get this newest, most advanced technology into the water because Russia had 500 submarines. In the US, we only had 150. And you know, this tremendous leap in technology with this new fleet of US submarines would level the playing field with the Russians. Now, at a really high level, the US Navy allowed too many compromises, too many variations in developing this new weapon system 
that required a lot more stricter attention and control and better testing. Now, I think Admiral Rickover, he's the father of the nuclear Navy, he summed it up best. He said, I think it's important that we reevaluate our present practices, where in the desire to make advancements, we may have forsaken the fundamentals of good design, engineering, and construction. Now, in my review of it, I think the US Navy went too far too fast, but 129 people did not die in vain because out of that was born the SubSafe program. It was developed to be a robust aggregation of design standards, procurement, construction, testing, inspection, audits, and operations so that should flooding occur in a submarine, a submarine could return to the surface. Now, how good is the SubSafe program? It's been pretty good. While the US lost 16 US submarines to non-combat operation between 1915 and 1963, since SubSafe has been implemented, no nuclear submarine has been lost, and nuclear submarines have traveled 51 million miles in the ocean. So it was a really, really powerful framework. Now, this was the framework that I was exposed to that I lived in for months on end, for years on end. I was not only exposed to it, but I was also tapped to be the submarine SubSafe coordinator to make sure that we were carrying out SubSafe on our submarine. So today, I'm excited to share with you the five pillars of purpose-driven safety that I was exposed to in the submarine force, and also then I used in countless companies to significantly reduce safety and quality-related incidents. What you'll see is it's certainly a powerful framework of processes and procedures and testing and inspection, but it's mostly how do you establish a safety mindset, a culture safety, that's what we need so we can be successful.